Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Good day, listeners. Welcome back to another episode of the Forty Orty Podcast. Today is a little bit of a strange one because I'm recording on the weekend. It's been a very relaxing, calm weekend for me. Went to this really posh spa、um, on Friday for my girlfriend's birthday, and it was very, very crazy place. Very crazy place. But I'm feeling nice and fresh and, and cool for the next week, and I've got a little podcast to sort of get things going. Today we're going to be diving further into the topic of autism parenting. We're going to talk a lot about the divide between the autistic community and the the autism parent community. It's something that I think not a lot of people address. We we tend to in these days we tend to fight rather than get together and and have a honest conversation. So this is what we're going to be doing, and I have someone here, Eileen, who is here to talk about her experiences with being quite badly bullied online by the the actually autistic community. Eileen, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited for us to talk about this subject today. Me too. It's it's definitely something that I've wanted to wanted to address for a long time. As I said, we we tend to in this in this culture to be a bit bit triggered by a lot of different topics, and you know if someone says something that we don't like or we don't agree with, or someone's on the other side of the fence, then we t- we tend to be very harsh with with those people. Would you like to give everybody an idea of your background, who you are, what you do as a job, the kind of stuff that、yeah. you do online? So my name is Eileen Lamb. I'm French, as you can tell by my accents.、Um, but I live in Texas now,、uh, in the、U- United States. I'm a mother of two little boys.、Uh, Charlie is seven, and he has severe autism. He's、uh, mostly nonverbal. My youngest son is Jude, and I'm on the spectrum myself. But I was diagnosed with level one autism, which is, you know, would have been considered Asperger's.、Uh, yes. Yeah. A few years ago,、um, online I talk about autism a lot, mostly from my perspective as a parent raising Charlie. But I talk about my own autism too, and I wrote a book about it called All Across the Spectrum, which talks about you know this the spectrum because even though we share the same diagnosis, our experiences are so different from each other. My son、yeah. and my experience. So、mm-hmm. that's why it was important for me to, you know, talk about all sides. I don't like the word sides, but <laughs> all of the spectrum. I understand you know? what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I think there, there is definitely, I, I, I definitely underexaggerated, or, or underestimated rather, just how varied autistic people can be.、Uh, like, I, I knew that it was a spectrum, and I knew that we all share different traits, but there is a. A wide variety of of traits that are out there. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's confusing for people who don't know about autism too, because like in the movies, you often see like see autism as a、uh, you know very gifted people like、uh, the good doctor and Rain Man, and you know always、mm-hmm. a savant skill or something. When in reality, for so many people, like it's not like that. Like I don't have a skill like this. I wish you know. <laughs> yeah, I I completely agree with you. I think. I think also that like the stereotypes around an autism condition as well, like being good at maths or engineering or coding, or <laughs> it's like one of those things. Like the the more that I talk to autistic people, the more that I realize just how <laughs> like that there's not many people who have met that are very very good at maths who are autistic. <laughs> could you tell Could you tell us about sort of when when you did your Your book and the, the kind of things that you did around it when it was released. Yes, I started writing it、um, 
a while ago. So two years ago, I pitched my book to a, a produce, a publisher and mm -hmm. they were really interested in my story and they also love my photography. So their idea was that I would tell my story about autism and the spectrum, but also include my photography to, to tell my story in a unique way. So that's what we did for my book. We uh, included photography with my story. And I like that because photography is, for me, a way to express myself. And I feel like I'm able to tell the story in a way that is really real. I started writing it in 2017, and it was published in 2019, uh, last year. And, you know, I haven't done much promoting of it on social media and, and stuff because I, I don't want people to feel like I'm profiting of autism or, and by the way, like writing a book, that's not going to make you rich. Like it's something <laughs> that I see uh, always on social media, oh, writing a book about it, you know, profiting off of it when really like writing is not a very profitable thing. In any case, I, yeah, I loved writing that book and the pictures and being able to tell my story and showing both sides again i don't like that word but i think you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, of the spectrum all aspects of the spectrum you know and how different autism can be for everyone yeah. and that's also what i do on social media i try to 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 show this but always with a lot of love and because it's important for me that people know that autism is not a gift for everyone but also that it's not something to be scared of and that you know autism autistic people are just as worthy of love and you know having jobs and being respected as anyone else so it's really a balance between the two and that's kind of what i do on social media or at least try to do well i've i've had a look through your so your instagram and your pictures and stuff and you are right like your your photography is really good thanks <laughs> like it it definitely tells like a, a a story in each each picture that that you've Thank posted. You. Would you be able to give us um, your experience with being diagnosed and the kind of journey that you went on to get your son diagnosed as well? Yeah. So my son got his diagnosis first. Um, so Charlie was 22 months old when he was officially diagnosed. We noticed that he lost his words when he was around 18 months. Mm -hmm. which was really scary as a parent. He only had, you know, a dozen words, so he wasn't like a big talker or anything. But, you know, I, he was at the edge where we expected him to start talking more, not less. So that's when we called early childhood intervention in the United States. Yes, yeah. Come to your house and do, you know, a free assessment uh, or ship depending on your income. And... He, Charlie qualified for all they had to offer. So it was speech therapy, occupational therapy, parent support. But after a few months, they told us that it was basically out of their league and that Charlie needed more help than this. So that's when they recommended we get him evaluated for autism. Mm -hmm. And he took the M-chat. I don't know if you have that in the UK, probably too. M-chat. M-chat, yeah, it's 20 questions. And I think a score of seven or higher is indicates, okay, you got to get your, you know, your kid evaluated uh, right away. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort, of like or less is... sort of like a personal thermometer to, to, you know, on whether to go in to get a diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. For like parents who, you know, are, are worried they can do it at home and very quick. And Charlie scored 18 uh, out of 20. So we're like, you know, really um, a lot of, uh, of concerns, obviously. And yeah, he was diagnosed at 22 months old by the developmental pediatrician here in the US. Mm -hmm. And from then he started ABA therapy. So that was Charlie's story. After he got diagnosed is when I decided to seek a, a diagnosis. Actually, I, I don't like that expression. I went through a therapeutic assessment to know why I was struggling, because I was struggling in a lot of ways that were similar to Charlie, but I, I didn't see how at that time it could be linked to autism. It seems so crazy to me that I would have 
lived with autism for so long without knowing. You know, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that much about autism then. I needed help from a professional. So I went through a therapeutic assessment that was like 20 hours of questions 20 and hours. talking. Yeah, it was really, really intense. <laughs> and at the end of it, you know that you got the right diagnosis at least. You know, it's not a, a little thing. Yeah. 20 but hours of it talking. It was mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Well, not in a row. Oh, but... okay. Okay. I was just picturing yeah, yeah. you just like nodding off in an <laughs> no. assessment. Just like, can we please stop talking? This is oh too much. <laughs> That's funny. No, I couldn't do that either. Yeah, that, that was it. And at the end of the 20 hours, over a few weeks, <laughs> she told me that I indeed had autism. Mm -hmm. Level one, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I felt relieved in some way that everything I had been struggling with as a kid in France had an explanation. Yes. Because I always yeah. felt like something was wrong with me. You know, like, why am I like this? Or even as an adult, like, why mm -hmm. can't I go to the grocery store without freaking out when people go to Target, uh, the store here, like, to have fun? Uh, and to me, it's like so stressful and scary to be inside a store. And I was like, what is wrong with me? And now I have all these, you know, so many things that started making sense after that. Like I can't get gas if I'm going to a different gas station than the one I know. Mm -hmm. I, if the buttons are different, like little things like this. And I had a very hard time maintaining friendships, making friends. Yeah. It must it be was quite. Really good. Like, um, I, I, I was I was diagnosed quite early at about ten. But I only really mm -hmm. started reading about autism when I was in my twenties at university. And um it definitely does it gives you a new lens on your life. You know, it helps you figure out why things were happening. I guess if if you don't if you didn't know that you were autistic, then you would, you know, assume that you, you were like you were like a bad person or that you just weren't capable and that it must be a very scary thing to, to deal with for such a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting how, I mean, a lot of people are, are starting to get diagnosed later in life. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I always wonder, like, would my childhood life have been different if I had known before? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's something I'll never have the answer to. But, you know, I was still in my mid-20s, so it wasn't super late either you know yeah but there's yeah, some people who are diagnosed <laughs> like when they're 50 or 60 or yeah that's that's that that's like you've you've learned that's like at the stage in life where you've learned how to cope with everything and you just sort of you've got your your life together and then someone comes along and says hey look you've been dealing with like so much of this stuff that you have no idea about oh my god yeah yeah I can't imagine that at all. Um, <laughs> has has because um, obviously you said that you saw a lot of your your own traits and your own behaviors and and difficulties in your son. Um, has that given has has your son's diagnosis and his sort of development given you sort of a different perspective on yourself? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and no. Like. There are so many ways in which I relate to Charlie. For instance, the noise. Like, it's something that's f funny in a way, it's not. But when there is a loud noise, we're always the two people within half a second with, you know, covering our ears. <laughs> and people just look at us like, what? What? They didn't even hear anything. You know, we have uh, it's some kind of connection here on how autism affects us in similar ways. But seeing the difference, in like communications, for instance, between Charlie and I, it's given me a different perspective on autism in general, not not just my own, but that's what motivated me to, to talk about it, mm -hmm. just so people can really understand the wide range of experiences of, of autism. That's a, a very good cause to kind of shoot for. I, 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 I don't understand, well, I do, I do understand like how people can be, but personally you know if if you're going out of your way to try and change people's lives and, and make a positive impact i you know all this this abuse that you've been receiving just 
it, it, it astonishes me that people can the I think it's the combination of the internet and it's also a lot of different cultural factors that are, that are coming into play as uh, society progresses. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so w- one of the things that I've been trying to think about for like a while, pe- people don't like anything relating to levels of functioning in the in the autistic community. Um, I I think I'm I'm pretty sure I, I understand where it's coming from because it's kind of like. It's. I think it's. It's mostly people who would be diagnosed medically as being high functioning don't particularly feel like that label applies in in all sense, or at least to, to an outsider, really encapsulates their experience. It it makes it difficult though. So you know, I work I work in schools and I I meet a lot a lot of kids with with autism who vary in their ability to be independent and so it's it it's one of the things that i've been thinking about for a, for a while now because it's like how how do we how do we talk about the, the the kids and the adults that can't live on their own and can't sort of function independently without using functioning labels it's like right yeah i think it's it's important though to you know to make the difference uh you know like how before it was Asperger's and then autism, like it was different. And I f- feel like that was perfect because it showed people that the difference in, you know, skills and being able to be independent and communicate and, you know, functioning level, I don't always see them as harmful because when someone says low functioning, I don't see it as, oh, he can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Look at that. No, it's more of, you know, he's going to le- need more support rather than he can do this. So maybe that's the way to phrase it, a higher, higher support or uh, s- severe. You know, I, I use severe because I feel like it's, you know, it's one word. And again, it's not, I don't find it degrading because it's just a way to indicate that someone mm-hmm. needs more help than another person. You know, it's not their fault. So I try, you know, I say I have high functioning autism too. There's there's a balance, and I'm sure we could find a middle ground between functioning functioning labels and using nothing at all, um, just so there is a way to tell the difference. Yeah, maybe we'll find a way someday. Yeah, I think it's it's a lot like a lot to do with words and how they appear and make us feel. So things like severe and autism combined, kind of. You know, it, no, no matter the intention and meaning behind the word, some people I don't think can get past the the actual word, if that makes sense. Like in this society, we take things for at, at face value and then leave them. So we'll see something, they use a word that we don't like. We say, "Don't use that word," and then we get on with our day. Or we, but the thing is, especially especially in your case, make making that dis, um, distinction. Yeah, yeah, making that distinction between people who can live on their own and can you know they, they have difficulties they have a, have a lot of difficulties whether it's like social or sensory or executive functioning but they can live independently in a lot of cases whereas when we're talking about someone who's more low functioning they can't what i was wanting to, to you know to ask is to to mention is that th- that sort of uh, culture of, of getting quite upset at someone because of the words that they use or the the concepts that they use that other people don't agree with and people who reply and react to those things may, may only be sending like a a single line of disagreement or hate or something like that but for people that, like yourself you get many of those and i'm i'm guessing that they can't sort of stack up and they they, they don't really make you feel that comfortable on social media it's terrifying could you tell us a little bit about your, your experiences with online bullying or harassment? Yeah. So, you know, like I said, to me, it's important to show all aspects of, of the spectrum because, you know, on paper, I have the same diagnosis as Charlie. But in reality, he's probably going to need someone to take care of him for the rest of his life. And I don't know if he'll able to find a way to communicate, whether that's verbal or not. We've tried so many things from 
PEX, uh, AAC, uh, GoTalk, uh, sign language, and of course, you know, uh, talking. So just to show you that we're trying everything to get him to communicate with us. And right now he can express basic needs such as I want plus item with AAC. And he has like 20 word approximation. He has apraxia too. So it's just, you know, it adds up. But it's important to me that people see the difference between both sides, again, that word, (laughs) of the spectrum. And for autistic adults, a lot of them, they find this offensive that I use terms like severe autism or that I put my son in ABA therapy. There's a lot of controversy about ABA therapy um, and a lot of misinformation too. For instance, autistic adults uh, say that ABA therapists don't try and teach autistic kids to communicate unless it's a verbal form of communication, talking. But that is not true at all because like i said the first thing they tried with charlie when he was two was specs you know the picture communication exchange communication program Mm -hmm. um, where the kid gives you a little picture to tell you what he wants that didn't work for us but like we tried a lot of different form of communications and another um, misinformation about aba is that they prevent kids from steaming yes and they will only do it if the kid is harming himself like they don't stop charlie unless he starts he has a steam where he just like hits his face and he even got a stab stab infection from it because uh, you know Mm -hmm. he cut himself a row and he got infected you know that's when you stop it and i don't think it's bad to say this you know like why would i want that and you know some kids like head head bang and they can't control their steams like, in any case, I'm talking about all of these things on social media and they don't agree with me. So then I get bullied and I use that word and it's a powerful word, but it is absolutely what it is because it's not one comment here. When one of them comes, I'm sure they post my post in one of their private group because every time I get one comment, they're also like dozens and dozens, sometimes hundreds, hundreds at a time coming to attack me on my post. <sighs> Yeah, I have like a folder with all the screenshots and it's very hurtful stuff, like hearing that I'm an abusive mother, that CPS should be called on me, all of these things. Oh, and I'm being told all the times that I'm ableist or that I have. And then when I tell people, but you know, I'm on the spectrum too. They said that I have self-internalized ableism. So basically, I feel like I can never win and it's frustrating to me because... I love a lot of things in the neurodiversity movement. Like I think the concept is good, but the way people are going about it and taking their ideas too far is just hurtful for our, the autism community mm-hmm. as a whole. And I've, I've talked about this with some of my, my um, autistic friends on Instagram. And every, everyone that I talk to always has this deep-seated anxiety about saying the wrong thing like these are people who follow this stuff and and sort of tweet and use you know use things like ableist and 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 all of that stuff and they really struggle with the with that anxiety they don't want to say the wrong thing i've had people who have joined the the autistic community and have been very very much shunned and put off doing their own advocacy it's very frustrating to to for me to hear stories like that because it's it's very much just a set of jargon that people have constructed just over the time of social media everyone's trying to be more socially acceptable and and trying to you know f- figure figure out what so, some nasty other people are doing doing to them and it just it just feels awful you know i consider myself to be quite open minded and i, I do like to have discussions rather than, you know, as, as, as happened to you, sort of make those snap decisions about someone and then push them away and trying to bully them and, and make them feel terrible. When in reality, they probably haven't even read your book and, and don't really understand who you are as a person. Yeah, that's true. You know, and I feel like I'm pretty balanced, all things considered too, um, and that I could find some middle ground with them. But when you're getting insulted on each post and 
I mean, constantly harassed by the same people. It's no, like it doesn't make me want to have conversations, you know, just last week, a mother lost her life who was an amazing autism advocate um, in a house fire. I don't know if you've heard about this in the, in the US. No, I haven't. She had a son with severe autism and she uh, he, he didn't understand that he needed to get down. You know, the house was on fire. So she went back inside to try to, to save him from, from the fire and telling him, come down, you know, we got to get out. The house is on fire. But he... He wouldn't, and he, he was a he was a big boy. He was fifteen, I believe, and they both passed away in a fire. So she passed, trying to save her son. That's awful. And what happened uh, two days after that is that some of those actually autistic, you know, it's the hashtags they use, the neurodiversity movement, posted a blog about insinuating that it was a murder suicide. Really? And that she had, you know, set her house on fire on purpose. And, you know, the, the family saw the post and they apologized after that and took down the post. But it just, to me, showed how much hatred there is against autism parents. I know mm -hmm. this term is also frowned upon, autism mom, autism parents. To that even after a, mo a mother dies trying to save her autistic son, like, they still managed to, you know, go af after her. It's just, just like so, it affected me so much to read that. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, I, I really wish they would chill and not attack people all the time because there are so many parents who would listen to their experiences and what they have to say if it was done in a way that is not aggressive. Mm -hmm. For instance, I, I don't mind if people say I have autism or... Uh, but, you know, person first language or not, yeah, like yeah, autistic. I don't, I don't mind either. Like, yeah. I, I, I don't mind. And they attack all parents who say their sons have autism. Like if someone says, my son has autism, they said the, the autistic community doesn't like that word. But I'm like, but that's not true though. It's just, you know, you and your group of people because I talk to a lot of autistic people who don't, care either way you know as long as it's respectful i don't mind if people say you have asperger's um you have high functioning autism you are autistic you have autism it's it's okay i know people don't they mean well mm -hmm. so it's very yeah. um it's like with the the world has been trained to focus on the very superficial meaning behind things <laughs> like yeah. You use this language, so this means that you're a bad person inside, even if you don't know it. It's very, I think it's, it's just awful because I think if people would actually sit down and talk or, or, or listen and try and try and be respectful of each other, we could, you know, this divide between autism parents and the autistic community would be smaller, you know, or at least just a little bit more integrated. What, what I like to say is, <laughs> Everybody can be an arsehole. Like, you can be an autistic arsehole. You can be a mother of an autistic person and you can be an arsehole. <laughs> Everyone can be one. You can be neurotypical and you can be an arsehole. It doesn't distinguish based on, you know, based on what you believe. It's just about wh whether you're willing to hear people out and sort of try and find common ground, I think. I agree. Apart from the the messages and the, the comments and the the bullying. Have you ever tried to talk to anyone from from the autist the adult autistic community? Have you managed to find someone who gets what you're saying <laughs> and doesn't shun you for it? Yeah. I actually two people more than two, no three people who used to be part of the actually autistic community. It's funny because it's just a hashtag, but yet it's also a community, you know. Mm -hmm. Or anyway, they, they left the, the community and then reached out to me to, uh, to apologize. And that was so nice <laughs> to hear from people who used to, you know, be part of those who attacked me mm -hmm. online, then uh, come around. And yeah, I also talk about... Two people, I mean, who have never been part of the actual autistic community, but who are 
uh, on the spectrum themselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, something that's really sad that I, I talk about in my book too, is that when I had a, I got diagnosed with autism, I thought that I was going to have, um, that I had found my people, that I was going to have somewhere where I belong mm. finally. And it's just been the worst. You know, I was bullied in France at, in high school, but nothing like what I've experienced by people who I feel like should be my own, you know, that I, I, I thought we were going to be like a big family and all in this together. And so it was really heartbreaking to feel like so rejected. And yeah, that's another sad thing about this. That's awful. I'm so sorry. I, <sighs> it's, it's, yeah, it's really awful. Nice ones. Yeah, there are some nice ones. You're right. You know, like, there are assholes everywhere, but there are also nice people everywhere. It's just about like <laughs> it's about finding the uh, the nice ones. <laughs> yeah, they're hard to find. Why do you think there is such a a big divide between the autistic and the parents' communities? Not just for well, yourself, but sort of the wider community. I think because. First of all, actually, autistic are very intense in their uh, views and advocating, and parents feel attacked. And when you feel attacked, it doesn't make you want to, you know, listen necessarily, which makes the actually autistic community even more angry. And it's just like a circle. But also, I think there is a big divide because those actually autistic who attack parents are, and I'm going to use that term high functioning for the most part and parents you know often have sons who are more or daughters severely affected by autism so they see the difference between you know someone who is able autistic but attacking them at right this moment you know on social media and they see their kid at home who's you know not even able to communicate to get a glass of water and so it's hard to understand the actually autistic perspective when what they see at home is so different from the experience of the people mm -hmm. yeah. attacking them. And I think that's making the divide be you know bigger. Yeah, yeah, I can I can definitely see that. One one thing that I have noticed as well is bas basically um, when I started doing my my podcast and my YouTube stuff, I joined many many different groups. I joined some autism only groups. I joined some open autism related groups. This is on Facebook. And um, I joined some parent groups as well. One one thing that I've, you know, I've, I've found is that there, there is a lot of hate uh, brewing up in these, these groups, like from both sides, you know, like autistic people saying, oh God, like, look at these people, they're, they're torturing their kid. And, or, or I've had such a, a, a you know, I've had a really horrible experience with ABA and, you know, th th this is a common practice. And then on the other side with the parents, I see, you know, look, th th these people don't understand, you know, my, my kid. These people don't understand, like, what, what I've been trying to do as a parent. And, and some, sometimes they can be quite mean and, and vindictive towards autistic people in those groups. So I definitely think that the, the divide is... It's, it's very much a, a product of segregation. Like we, we've got a very big mentality of we're in to fight. It's difficult to, 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 to try and bring these people together with, without having that ingrained mindset of these people are the enemy. We need to prove them wrong. We need to show them how they're doing wrong rather than kind of chatting like <laughs> Ex exchanging ideas and, and trying to connect and reach some common ground. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my opinion on it. And it's, it's something that I've been, you know, as I said, been thinking about for a long time. My mom, like she's an autism parent. She, she mm -hmm. has, you know, ideas that differ from some parents, but they, but within that community, they, they talk about it and they, they sort of connect, but the other communities involved in that sort of fighting mentality, it's very difficult to sort of bring people together in that sense. Yeah, it's extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. 
one of the the, the aspects of you know what we consider to be evil is <laughs> um, believing so much in something that you go to the extent to bully and 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 hate or seek revenge on good people, and it's not necessarily a, a conscious act, but it but it happens. Right. It's like you've got justification to do it. If that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Totally. In your eyes, what ways do you think that we could possibly bring these people together? And sort of op- open that dialogue and, and get rid of all this bad blood. It's a very difficult question to answer, but yeah, you know, I think that both sides have to understand each other. So I I get it. You know, actually, autistic want to be heard because it's true. We're the one living with autism, and some of them, for instance, did have bad experiences with ABA, and I don't want to invalidate them you know just because my experiences have been great doesn't Mm -hmm. mean that there's you know yeah but so i think it will take validating their feelings while having them understand that you know things have changed and parents are not the enemy we want the best for our kids and also it would take actually autistic not you know like there are there is a group with like five six seven thousand people that is just to shame autism mom like that is not okay that's just like straight up bullying you know so they need to drop that aggressive way of advocating and talking to people because you don't get anyone to listen to you when you do that and i think parents will be more likely to listen and make them feel validated and and heard if that happen mm-hmm um, and I also think that if we're going to be talking about this subject, we need to drop the puzzle piece and, you know, those things that are like, they, they don't do anything for the autism community to fight, to fight about whether the puzzle piece symbol is harmful or not, or whether, you know, someone prefers to be called autistic or person with autism. You know, let's focus on the things that are actually going to help. Uh, the autism community like ABA therapy that's a big issue because that's something that can possibly help so many people yet there is so much so much misinformation right now because 20 30 years ago it wasn't what it is now and I think that's a subject we need to talk about just Mm -hmm. get out of the way so we can find some common grounds and there are actually some groups where both autistic and parents and professional are trying to not reform ABA, but, you know, come together for a, a solution. So that's... That's, that's brilliant. So, so you've got lots of sort of practitioners and, and parents and autistic people having that, that dialogue and, like, talking yes. about some of the aspects of it. That's, that's really productive. That's, that, that's really great to hear. Yeah. Obviously, w- w- when you get into this... If you if you shoot straight for the media, like if you, if you're autistic and you you go online and you find these concepts and these these people with these these ideas and these emotions behind things, it's it's hard not to turn a blind eye and not read into it a bit more. An ABA was definitely one of the things that I personally didn't look into. You know, I just yeah, ABA is bad. Like I hate it. It sounds horrible. They torture these kids. Not good. But no. the, I know, I know. But you know, that was my 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 gut reaction, and I know it's 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 definitely something that it happens in everybody. But I think the the difference is being able to sort of just suppress it a little bit and realize that getting more information on the topic and getting other people's opinions is a lot more beneficial to yourself. Then sort of uh, putting up a wall and yeah, podcast that I that I did with um, Michelle Rogers. Um, we we were sort of talking about ABA because I work in schools and some of the practices that we do with the children are ABA based. As as you said, things like with the pecs and the the visual cards and the, the timetables and um, way, ways to help them communicate. And looking, looking at sort of ABA in, in, in on paper and sort of looking into the research, like it does seem to work. 
you know, like I'm not going to say that it doesn't work. And, you know, the more that I'm learning about it, the more that I'm realizing that these people who are grown up and gone on social media to talk about ABA have that experience of ABA when it was, you know, sort of first being reformed and kind of used. And I know it's been used for longer than that, but it, I think it has changed a lot. Well, and if they're able to talk about it on social media 20 years later, maybe it did work because I would love for Charlie to be able to, you know, uh, give his opinion on autism on social media 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. I think it's it, it's a lot to do with people who are sort of, I guess, sub subjected to bad practitioners. So not ne it's not necessarily the practice that's the problem. It's the the way that it's delivered. Exactly. Are they too rigid with it? Are they too loud and, and dismissive and they don't use enough positive feedback and they don't give them breaks and they don't make sure that they enjoy the sessions? Like, There's a lot of factors that come into that. It's not necessarily the, the protocol or the things that you do. It's whether that teacher is good like, at what they do and they make sure that the, the child is happy. Right. Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, if you go to the doctor and you don't like him, he's bad, you're not going to stop going to the doctor. It doesn't mean that doctors are bad. You just had a bad experience with a doctor. And that's something that people don't understand is that just because there is, you know, a few bad therapists doesn't mean that the profession, the practice of ABA mm -hmm. is abusive. And that's also where, you know, they could make a difference as autistic adults by just telling parents, hey, listen, so ABA is fine. Just make sure that when you look for a, a center, an ABA therapy center, they are not doing these things, mm -hmm. but they are doing these things. How about that? Isn't that a nice way to, you know, talk about the issue? You know, so you're get they're getting their voice heard and parents are still getting ABA. They're just getting yeah. good ABA. Mm -hmm. And no fighting involved. Well, there's, you know, like M Michelle's child, she, I think it's she. Oh, God, I can't remember. Her child, <laughs> her child um, <laughs> is absolutely delighted to see the person that works with her with the ABA. Like, in, in my mind, I, I don't see how that is bad. You know, maybe they might, some, some people in, in the past might have been, had very kind of draconic vision of, of how to to help an autistic person but from from what i've seen in in schools it it doesn't seem abusive no it's not and it's not saying that you know anybody out there who has experienced aba and in, in, in the past right. and has had a bad experience that that those feelings and that experience aren't on valid which obviously is is you know something that you've always got to think about but it's 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 a different time zone it's a different method it's a different practitioner you know there's a lot of factors involved i think yeah so i think in, in terms of bringing communities together i think for, for, for the large scale things i think we just need to work on seeing past this the superficial stuff and and shooting for, for really what that person is trying to achieve with their work if someone's trying to raise awareness of, um, for example, like with myself, like comorbidities and autism, then it should, you know, that, that is my way of ad advocating and that's what I'm trying to get from it. And if I use terms, terms that you don't agree with, it, it doesn't get away from what I'm trying to do. Um, that's, that's, I think if we, if we can get past that and we can teach people to be less emotionally charged about topics and and try and expand their knowledge and follow people that they don't agree with and and sort of hear them out and think about it and do their own research then those lines that are drawn in these social media platforms would you know ease ease up a little bit it's good it's a good theory <laughs> don't know if it would work in in reality i think you'd have to change a lot of people's minds about a lot of things yeah okay so would you like to give everybody three main things that you want people to take away from the podcast? Anything that we've talked about that you want people to think about? Yeah, I want people to know that autism 
is different for each person on the spectrum. That's really the most important thing for me. So I don't like when autistic people say we because like they don't speak for me and I don't speak for them either. You know, I speak for myself as an autistic adult and, and for my, my son. But, you know, if someone talk to you, your experience as an autistic adult will be different from mine, even though, you know, we share a lot of things in common. We're all different, just like neurotypical people are different too. You know, autistic people are different from each other. So there is not one autistic voice. And that's very important, you know, because when people read things about, oh, autistic people are like this, or oh, autistic people prefer that we say autistic instead of person with autism. Well, no, not all. We're all different from each other. Another thing that's important to me is bullying and being aggressive when trying to get someone to listen to you is just going to have the opposite effect. I, I don't want to listen to people who are just yelling at me and coming to my social media all the time, like hundreds at a time, to tell me that I'm abusive and a horrible mother. That's just not useful, especially since we have more in common than they think. And I would love for everyone to come together. Like in the way I said, for instance, about ABA, autistic adults can advise parents on what to look for in an ABA center instead of just saying a very drastic ABA is bad. No, it's, it's not black or white. You know, there is nuance and that's where we can meet each other. And that's what we should uh, focus on. I think uh, the last one will be that I want autistic people to understand that it's possible to feel two ways about something. For instance, just because I'm going to say my son has severe autism doesn't mean that I don't love him because I often hear that from autistic people. Well, clearly you hate your son. Look at how you talk about him because I say yes, severe autism. To me, it's a way to describe that he needs more help. And, you know, just because I describe struggles, because autism is not just a gift. It might be for certain people, but it's not for yeah. everyone. And it's not a gift for me. It's not a gift for my son either. It's okay to have negative feelings about something. You know, we can't take it to the extreme of if a parent say that autism is hard, it means that they hate their kid. No, no, of course not. But it's really heartbreaking when your son is crying for hours on end and you don't know why because he doesn't have a way to communicate. Like, I'm allowed to say that, you know, it breaks my heart. I'm his mom and I don't know how to make it better. Like that happens one time, he was limping and it took like 30 x-rays to find out where the the fracture was just because he wasn't able to tell us where he was hurting. Mm -hmm. We knew he was hurting because he was crying and limping. And like, that's hard. And so autism can be really hard, yes. Does it mean we don't love our kids? No. I love Charlie so much, you know. And I want people to know that I love my son. I love Charlie. And most parents do. I mean, of course, I can speak for all parents in the world, but <laughs> I... I know that all the ones around me on social media talking about autism, they love their kids and they want to help them. Yeah. I, I appreciate those. I, I think you've, you've definitely summed up um, what we've, what we've talked about. I do think that, that there are a lot of difficulties, but I think if we keep talking about these things, then, then hopefully we can make a breakthrough. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think so, yeah. it's, it's not, it's not nice to have these divides especially when both sides are trying to in different ways and in, in with different things, but we're, we're all trying to do what's best for autistic people. Exactly. And that's, that's the kind of, that's the kicker. And yeah, I think autism does, as, as you said, present a lot of challenges. Our school, school and system and our knowledge about autism parenting is still kind of growing and changing now in this in this present time 
with all that knowledge and stuff, it does make parenting harder. Like it's, it's got to, and it makes teaching a lot harder as well. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you don't like them and you don't love them and you don't care about them and you don't put in effort to connect with them. Well, I've got one last question for you. This is an open question and it's, it can be completely subjective to yourself or to your general view of autism or to your son's autism. But what does autism mean to you? A lot of things. Autism is a lot of things for different people and it means a lot of things for me. Sometimes I like my autism because it can create some funny situation and you know when I take things too literally and my little quirks you know autism can be attaching I love when Charlie flaps his hand and he looks so happy sometimes he just starts laughing I don't know why and it's just so so sweet I like that it makes us see the world probably differently than other people whatever that means for each autistic person I also think that it comes with a lot of struggles. And for certain people, it's, you know, little struggles. And for some people, it's a lot of struggles and they're very intense and they're going to prevent them from living independently. So autism is a lot of things for a lot of people. And I think that's really what I want people to take away from this, this podcast. It is such... A unique experience for each person. There is some good things and some things that are less good and, and that's okay because at the end of the day we all want the same thing. We want people with autism to be respected and loved and to have the same opportunities and rights as anyone else and I hope we can all come together to, to make this happen. Beautiful. You bring it a tear to my eye. <laughs> that was such a nice... Thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. It's been really great to talk to you. I, th- I don't think I could have found a better person to, to talk about these these things with. <laughs> I'm so glad we did that. Yeah. <laughs> it is a potentially very in- inflammatory subject for a lot of people. So I'm guessing that it, if you've made it, if you made it to this to this point and you're from the autistic community then you know well done like it's hard to to take on board other people's ideas and and thought processes but it all it all goes down to you and what you think and the research that you do and the, the opinions that you hear out that's that's the point of this podcast you know and not everybody will get through to the ends and listen to it to it in uh with glee but at least we're talking about something that's important and that could change things for everybody. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> we can hope. We can try. Yeah. And that's, that's the spirit. That's the spirit that, all, that binds us together. Eileen, would you like to give some links out for people who want to follow your stuff or, or read your book and and all that yeah you can find me on social media at the autism cafe on instagram facebook twitter pinterest my website is theautismcafe.com and my book is on amazon as a kindle and hard book cover with all of my photography and it's called all across the spectrum brilliant and i definitely do recommend you go and check out eileen's account if only just to look at the awesome photography that she's uploaded. I, I, I love the, the picture that you have. Is, is, is that your song where, where it's got boys will be boys, but the boys is crossed out yeah. and it says what they're taught to be? Yeah. I like that one. Thanks. Yeah. It's very nice. That was a very hot topic <laughs> one. It's very well done. Thank you. <laughs> well, I really hope that anybody who's listening to this if you have any questions or you want to talk about this issue, take it to the Portioti podcast. Email me. We can we can talk about these issues from a different side if you want, or if you, if you have any ideas on or stories that you want to share. I am very open. My inbox is very open to all of that. 
please do not go onto Eileen's Instagram and harass her. That's not what we're trying to get from this. Please, please do not. Please do not. <laughs> oh God. I don't know how you do it. Like as soon as if I get a if I get a negative comment on YouTube, I I think about it for like the entire day. Like <laughs> I'm just like, is my content actually bad? Like, am I getting everything wrong? Is my brain oh my God, it's so dysfunctional hard. that so much? It's <laughs> Yeah, no, it's hard. And you get it on you get it on such a massive extent as well. So well done for for staying at it and, and keeping going strong and being a good mom and all of that stuff. It's, it's very admirable. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. I hope we make a difference somehow. And if you want to check out the 40 Audio podcast, you can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. There's some other places that you can find it. But if you want to go ahead over to my Anchor profile, all you got to do is type in 40 Audio podcast. Sometimes slips up. You can also check out my YouTube channel, Asperger's Growth, for videos on autism, mental health, dating on the spectrum. We've got a whole host of different things that you can watch through. I have talked about this on the the previous podcast, but I'm currently going through a very bad patch of mental health. It's very up and down at the moment. I'm back at work, so there's there's that, and I'm going to the gym, so my plate is very much full of things that I'm trying to do to kind of keep me level. So for the time being, I won't be uploading a lot of YouTube videos. There'll probably be one out every one month, one and a half months, depending on whether I've got time for it and depending where my head's at. I hope that everyone can appreciate that. And if you do want to stay updated with my life and the the, the other things that I'm doing, you can find me on social media, at Asperger's Growth. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Very long outro. Apologies for that, Eileen. <laughs> what what have you got planned for the for the rest of the day? Oh, it's quite early for you in comparison. You know, it's very <laughs> nice out because in Texas we get those summers where it's like forty degrees Celsius every day, and it's just getting nice. So I think we're gonna go take a walk, and I'll check out your your videos too. I've been so busy. I meant to do it before our podcast, and I didn't get a chance. So I'll have to go uh, check out your channel. You do you do a lot of stuff, so I, I understand yeah. that. <laughs> it's difficult for me to to sort of find time to do that stuff as well. So I completely understand. I'll have to check out your book as well. <laughs> Myself meaning to sort of um have have a read of that. Is it available on audiobook or is it just no, just ki- ebook, Kindle or or hard okay. copy? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have to check it out. When it, when I read it, I'll probably make a little post about it. So I'll link it back to the podcast and stuff. Oh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you everybody for listening to this episode. Stay cool, stay fresh, stay always autistic and awesome. You know, unless you're not autistic. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'll see you in the next episode. Later's. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs>